the recording. Right, so we're live. So welcome to another edition of the Featured Business visit brought to you by Visibility Impact and myself, James Moffat, in collaboration with Entnest, the home of entrepreneurs. And if you don't know who Entnest is, I guess everybody knows Entnest. Karen, you know Entnest? I just signed up, yeah. All right, okay. So I'm not going to go through and explain all of that. But you no, know, you can reach out to Victoria or within Entnest, you can see this, this training and questions and answers that they do every week. Okay, so with that said, this is a, a weekly show for our featured guests. You can be any type of business, or even if you don't have a business, you can still be a guest. And the format is pretty open, it's interactive. Normally I host this and now I'll just walk through our guest for the first 20 minutes or so. And then the, the guest can ask you questions and interact with you and we open it up pretty much after that, uh, unless there's any time within kind of the discussion that the host wants, the, the guest wants to ask a question to the audience. Uh, we kick this off every week with typically a live song from emily and but she can't make it this week but that's but, the main reason i was on this morning. yeah I, I i bet yeah but, so we do have a recording she has a ah. youtube channel and she has uh, tons of stuff recorded on there she does a lot of cover songs so i'm going to play that to kick us off nice. all right and then after that she'll disappear so we'll just come back to our guests so Welcome, Leo, for being our 58th guest. All right. Thank and you. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, I, I'm excited, actually, to learn more about you. So I know we've been connected for a while, but I, it wasn't until just the last week or so that I started to discover who you really are. Well, a little bit about you anyway. So let's, let's introduce Emily. So Emily, she'll get a copy of this recording. So Emily, once again, thanks for sharing this. And I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, and hopefully everything works fine. It's right. Okay. Right. You just let me know if you can see this. And where it's just hanging a little bit. Typically when I run a YouTube and a Zoom at the same time, it kind of hangs a bit, but you should mm. see. There you go. You should see my screen here. You can see my screen. Yes. All right, let's just. Do you hear? I found a love for me, blind just dying and fall asleep. Well, I found a boy, beautiful and sweet. I never knew what was someone waiting for me. Cause we were just kids when we fell in love Not knowing what it was I will not give you up In this time Don't just kiss me so Your love is all I own And in your eyes you're Well, I found a man 
Stronger than anyone I know He shares my dreams I hope that someday I share his home oh, I'll never love To carry more than just my secrets To carry love To carry children of She's uh, such a beautiful voice. Oh, whoops. I need to stop that. Great way to start the day. Yeah. She is a lovely lady. Yeah. So well done, Emily. I'm just, I'm just trying to stop the you. You should keep playing. All right. It's got a mind of its own. Hi, Paul. I missed your show. Yeah, hi, Paul. So Paul was our guest last what week, actually. Oh, Paul. <laughs> you're, you're late, Paul. Sorry, but I really battled to get on today. Really? Yeah, I don't know what it was, but anyway, eventually then it just by magic came. So I thought I was watching the video and I thought, what, this can't be right, but it was right. <laughs> as soon as you saw Emily, then yeah. everything was fine. <laughs> right. So, so that was a great song by Emily. So this is a, a cheering one and i asked her about the song actually and because you can hear backing singers yeah right so the backing singers are actually her oh my so, gosh yeah. so she records it she does it all herself so did the video the editing excellent i was quite impressed, quite yeah. impressed. wonderful yeah so thanks emily so I'll send a link to all of that as well so people can have a look at it themselves. So in the chat and stuff, I'll, I'll add some links and whatever. But if you, if you miss it here, what I do typically with the chat is I, I save the chat and I, I put it in Entlist as well so you can see all the notes there if we've missed anything. Okay, so without further ado, we're going to go across to our 58th guest. Right, Leo Bottery? Batari. Butter, Batari. That's right. You right. got it. Don't ask me to pronounce Pete's surname. <laughs> so easy. <laughs> Canalicchio. Canalicchio. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Not easy for me. I, I could get the maybe Bishop. I mean, uh, do that one. <laughs> maybe Bishop. 
<laughs> Maybe not. Maybe it's <laughs> yeah. the shop. Yeah. Anyway, so Leo, we don't know who you really are. Has anyone really, Leo? Do you know people here? Have you connected with anyone or had any long conversations or anything? Uh, uh, Victoria. Oh, Victoria. Yes. So I've had the good fortune to connect with Victoria. Yes, and talking about Antonest and. You know, and, uh, you know, it's easy to see in terms of, I think, why we get connected in that way, because when you look at Entnest and being about trusted human connection and collaboration, I mean, that's what, that's what I do. That's where my work lies as well. And it's just really been great to get connected and, um, you know, become more acquainted with the purpose of, of Entnest and what it's all about. And um, so we're excited about that and excited to be here with all of you. Excellent. So the, we do this a little bit different because we, I don't want to know too much about your business yet. I want to know, we want to know about you. Because Good. as I said before, uh, some guests can actually change. You, I mean, throughout your life's journey, you can change business a few times. So, but typically you are very much the same person. And, and it's kind of, we want to kind of find out who you are and then, and then we'll, transition across into your business so before we go to the business bit well we know you're in the u.s somewhere so for those that just joined we want to know kind of where you are now and this is the original place that you were born where i am now is carlsbad california and it is the other side of the country from where i was born and where i grew up i actually grew up in the boston massachusetts area um, so grew up a, you know, big sports fan, a big fan of the arts and education and all of the, um, culture that I think Boston affords, at least from a U.S. perspective in that regard. And, uh, you know, it was just a great place to grow up and, but, but it's cold. And so I, when I went to college, I went to school in Florida and, uh, went to Jacksonville university in Florida came back home for a little while and worked and then uh, lived in Florida for a good bit over 20 years. And I know Pete's in Florida now where I spent most of my time though was Northeast Florida, uh, Punta Vedra Beach, Jacksonville area, uh, where they play the players championship uh, on the, the PGA tour. And then also I lived in, in Tampa area for a little while uh, oh. as well. Yeah. Interesting. And, and had a, and it was interesting because I was doing some client work and uh, visited Colorado for the first time, which if you've spent time in Florida where it's flat and humid and all of that, and then you visit uh, Colorado, it's kind of like being on another planet. You know, it looks a lot like Walter's background here, you know, and it's very different. Uh, so ended up with a second home there for a while. And, and um, but, you know, over time, uh, Florida and uh Colorado kind of went away in terms of, of homes, but um, wanting to be out on the West Coast, um, first to be near the Colorado home, because there's a ocean on this side of the country too, and it was a little bit easier to go back and forth versus being from Florida. Um, but uh, California is a wonderful place, and I've been uh, very fortunate. Um, my wife and I are here. My wife and I have actually been married for less than two years. Uh, we both have uh, adult uh, children, um, if you will, uh, the oxymoron there, but they are um, basically in their early 30s uh, and late 20s. Uh, the four of them get along as if they grew up in the same household. Uh, they visit each other. They take trips. They do. I mean, it's really rather remarkable uh, how the family has come together in that regard. Um, so it's been a good time and kind of COVID when you think about it, especially when shelter in place uh, happened and people were like, huh, where do we want to hang out? So everyone kind of showed up at our house in Southern California and we had dinners every night and, you know, with no phones and no TV and just real conversation and the kind of uh, opportunity to connect as a family that uh, you don't always uh, have. And so, Although, uh, obviously, it was um, very, you know, tragic and difficult for so many people in terms of, for us at least, that upside of it was that time together that we may not have otherwise had. Excellent. So, I just want to ask a few questions there. So, the, the, the kids, I mean, you, you mentioned kind of the ages, uh, boys, girls, a mixture? Um, 
so three uh, daughters and a son, and we don't, we never use the word kind of step. There's no stepson, steps are the bonus daughter, bonus son. That's the, we, we kind of like that language a little better. You know, the connotation of step is never good. Uh, you know, between the wicked stepmother, the stepdad, yeah. stepkids, all that kind of stuff. So there are our bonus kids and they are basically, um, uh, basically two of them are at, you know, pages 32, um, 31 and then 28. So two at 32. Yeah. Right. So, so which were the two from you before? Uh, two daughters, Kristen and Taylor. All right, okay. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. it's good to and have then there's of... Darren, and then there's Darren and Noel. There's also. Okay. So you said you're in Tampa. Yeah, my sister lives there in North Tampa. So yeah, I used to live there for a while. Yeah, and I lived so... in a place called Tampa Palms. She'll probably know right where it is. Probably. I mean, I've been a few times, and we normally go to Clearwater and places like that, and in downtown. Mm. Tampa. So, but yeah, very beautiful. Love it. Uh, so, now California, I mean, it, that's also beautiful. I, I spent some time, everything, I mean, down there, Californian coastal highway. And I always managed to, to get an American muscle car when I used to go over to meetings, although they always tried to force me to have a Nissan. I said, no, I'm, I'm coming to have the American dream. I want a muscle car. Yeah, yeah. Not a Japanese car or something. So anyway, I remember driving down the coastal highway. Beautiful. But I, I worked with different companies from Redwood City and San Jose down to Santa Barbara. So oh, yeah, beautiful. Yeah, yeah really beautiful. I, I yeah. drove a gorgeous coastline convertible Camaro with my oh. daughter Ellie about four years ago from San Diego to Santa Cruz. So oh, very nice. muscle car up the West Coast. Yeah, you, 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 probably, you probably see on my LinkedIn profile, I, I follow the Mustangs, right? And, and yeah, always kind of the older ones. And yeah, you'll see my comments on these all the time because they're always like teasing me like to go and buy one, but can't afford one. Yeah, it's, it's either that or people take the Harley, you know? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Actually, these are funny enough in Switzerland, these are the, kind of the two main things that Swiss people like. I mean, it's kind of retired gentlemen going by Harleys. So you get different types of groups of Harleys. You get kind of the, the retired business professional, and then you get kind of get the like the, the really biker kind of guys. But sure. And and then if it's not that, it's the GTs, the Mustangs, and whatever. So lots of American cars here. Yeah. But anyway, we digress. So, so <laughs> and here we I drive we we drive German cars in our household. So what do you what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> Walter likes that. <laughs> yeah. So you, you you've got siblings. You, you when you grew up, I mean, you have. I do. I had two younger brothers. All right, and they're still in Boston, or that they're, they're yes. elsewhere. Now? They're All in Boston right. area. They like the colder weather. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, because the winters can be quite severe up there. Yeah, they are. Right. Although it was interesting, you know, with everything going on on the planet right now, I think the heat index uh, in Boston is supposed to be like 106 today, which is wow. you know, just unheard of, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. My, my sister, before she moved to Tampa, was in... Brooklyn in New York and so we we went to visit there many times and obviously to Boston as well so but it was okay in the summer although it could get very very humid and hot mm, absolutely. but the, the winters could be bitter right so it was kind of ex one extreme to another but she likes it now in Tampa because it's a constant weather pretty much all year round and a different pace of life so a lot of different so but anyway so leo you before we come on to the business let's just take you back a little bit to your kind of your childhood and your schooling so as a kid did you uh, have any hobbies or sports or interests that you want to share 
Sure. Uh, well, as a young kid, I obviously loved to play baseball, loved to play all the seasonal sports, which is kind of what you do in New England, you know, where when it's the season to play, whether it's basketball or hockey or, um, you know, uh, football or, or baseball, you just kind of do what's what's in season and always took a great interest in that. I took an interest in music for sure. I played a number of different instruments and loved, um, you know, music and, uh, you know, sang a bit as well. And um uh, yeah. Um, you know, and I was really into astronomy when, when I was really young, when I was a little kid, I just thought not because I cared about being an astronaut. I just thought it was really interesting to learn about what was up there, you know? And, uh, so that was fun. Yeah. Because you have an astronaut, a would be astronaut beside you. And boy, Ann. Okay. Oh, so, I thought you meant, uh, Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on how you've got That's your right. screen but yeah yeah and, and you've yeah. also got a pilot we've got a pilot here so you've got pete is a aviation and military pilot marine pilot i guess marine navy pilot. pilot navy That's it. okay i won't right. be too offended oh, okay. <laughs> no problem <laughs> right so with astronomy i mean that amazes me as well i mean i yeah, I, I just remember sometime many, many years ago, we went to uh, <clears throat> South Africa. So this will resonate with Paul because he's there. And I remember being in the Kruger Park and, and you've got zero light pollution. So just lying in the campsite on the ground, looking up at, you could see the Milky Way. And, and I think, wow, I've never seen anything like this in my life. And you could just lay there for hours, just gazing up at the, the stars. And so I can see a fascination with that. So, I mean, and I never, you know, in New England, you never quite had that view of it. But later in later years, uh, sitting in Colorado, mm -hmm. when you'd be up at a high altitude and you've got no ambient light and you're um, you've got that kind of lens into it. And I always felt and you know what it's like when you stare into a sky like that, the more you stare into it, the more stars emerge over time. Mm -hmm. And I always felt that it's a pretty good metaphor for a lot of things we do in life. If we pay attention and we dig deeper and we continue to look, we'll continue to discover. And, uh, you know, I think these kinds of things can be helpful, especially when we can make, we can not only appreciate the, the beauty and the magnificence of it on one hand, but we can kind of, um, uh, you know, connect it to our own lives in many respects. And I think uh, for me that, that mo those moments of sitting there staring into a night sky like that um, was really powerful. But you could see a lot more. I guess you had been an astronomer, you had a telescope. Well, so well let's be clear. I wasn't an astronomer in any space by any way, <laughs> shape or form. I was, as a kid, I really loved it. And I read all kinds of books and took all kinds of notes and did all kinds of things like that. I, I had a telescope, um, I did, but you know, I, I always enjoyed really, it was fun, of course, to look at certain things up close uh, with the telescope, but it was also more important to just take in all of it without mm -hmm. looking at it through my phone or looking at it through mm -hmm. <laughs> through some device you know but so, did you yeah. did you ever go to kind of one of these lookout places where they have the huge telescopes that you could look through mm -hmm. no no i bet that would be magnificent yeah yeah I, I think it would just to see a completely different perspective in the way that you see from kind of your own visual capabilities to something magnified so many times but yeah, something that yeah, I'd like to try. So yeah, also you said that you're into outdoor activities and sports. So baseball. Yeah, I, ra I ran for you know I, I I still run some, but now I'm a little little older now, so I don't run as long distance as I used to. I've run thirteen marathons. So, and, so, you, uh, so how many? What was that? Thirteen. Oh, right. Okay. I, I, yeah. And uh, different ones around the US, um, Chicago, New York, um, Boston, Pittsburgh, I mean, Disney a couple of times. Friday the 13? Excuse me? 13 because of Friday 13? Or no, it's a really good coincidence, though, uh, for today. But no, uh, I think 13 because when I started training for my 14th and I started getting these little micro tears in my calves and things like that, it was like, you know. 
it became a little tougher to, it, you know, it isn't the race that's really the hard part. It's the it's the 18 weeks that you put in ahead of time to prepare for it, which I've always enjoyed it. But that's, you know, that that's what kind of can beat up your body a little bit. Yeah, I just started running again this week, funny enough, after, mm. I mean, since we had the, the kids, the twins, I hadn't done any exercise really. And yeah, I was kind of missing it. So I arranged with a neighbor that let us start running. So we went out just for a, a short kind of 5K. I mean, this is, yep. and and I just take it from there. So yeah, I, I felt good after it. So looking forward to the next one. Yeah, I'm probably going to, I'm going to go for a run after we're um, done this morning. So it'll yeah. be nice. I did mine at seven o'clock this morning. So you still got an hour or so before you can start. Oh yeah, got plenty of time. <laughs> yeah. They say it sets you up for the day, but getting out of bed early in the morning to go running, it, it's not an easy thing to do either. So lots of different sports. So you've done running and I, I see, I mean, in, in the profile i mean the questions that i sent you've also done cycling climbing so pretty adventurous i like to um yeah i'm not the guy that wants to jump out of an airplane you know because i don't get that i think some people are kind of hardwired to get that adrenaline rush from that that's probably not me but i do love to do things that i think are you know test me physically mm -hmm. Although I, I probably play a lot more golf now than I do climb yeah. mountains or, or run, you know, but, yeah. uh, but I, I love doing that as well. And so Pete, did you jump out of a plane? Uh, my goal was never to jump out of a perfectly good airplane. So the answer Wise is man. no. <laughs> but you, you're the man. pilot, but didn't you have to eject one time? No, no. no we, we had to learn how to put on a parachute and I certainly knew uh, how to and was prepared to do so. But basically in the plane I flew, if you um, we flew most of the time over the ocean. So if you had to jump out, you might as well, you know, like just killed yourself because you're going to probably never be found or some shark was going to eat you. So mm -hmm. uh, better to ditch the airplane and, and hope that worked and jump in a raft and somebody might find that. But uh, the answer is no, although I think it would be exhilarating. Now, I did jump off the side of the Teton Mountains uh, paragliding one time, and that was pretty pretty fun. Um, that's as close as I've come. Yeah, I like it. Uh, actually, Leo, do you do... I have to ask you this question because I, I ask everyone. Did you do go-karting? I have was a kid, sure, a couple uh, times. Because... It, We've had actually had a lot of guests that, that do go kart, and I've been champions as well. So, wow, we, we'd yeah. all like to get together and have some karting <laughs> kind of competition, <laughs> right? But James, you need to split us on karting amateurs and pro. <laughs> yeah, we haven't found the location yet. So, you now you, you do something more passive in there or, or more easier going with the golf. Yeah, well, um, physically anyway. I mean, it's a, um, it's a d demanding, very exacting sport, you know. Um, but it's but it's a lot of fun. And my wife and I play together, and we get our family out and play together. And so it's it's terrific. It's very different. Well, I played tennis in college too. And when you think about the dynamic of tennis, where you're hitting a ball at someone pretty much as hard as you can, versus when you're all on a golf course and you're playing against the golf course, really not one another. And it sets up a completely different dynamic. Uh, when um you know you can really go out and have fun and, and enjoy that together so, so it's great you're, you're pretty good at golf oh all right yeah. and your wife better than you uh my wife actually just started uh taking it up a couple of years ago which i thought oh. was ra rather brave you know to take up the sport uh and she's doing great i mean she's she hits the ball beautifully and she has a lot of a lot of fun and enjoys it quite a bit she's got a better attitude about it than, than anyone than anyone else you know she I, I remember at a podcast guest one time that talked about had this quote basically and i don't know it came from um, a book i can't remember actually the title of the book um was that expectations are the thieves of joy and so i, I thought it was uh <laughs> You know, so she she is smart enough to not have any expectations of what she's going to do out there. So when she hits a great shot, she appreciates it. And she uh, misses a shot. It's not the end of the world, you know, for 
otherwise we can get caught up in our expectations every once in a while but uh so we we learn from her as we as we play excellent so th there's a lot of women here actually in switzerland that uh, it seems to be more women that are joining and playing golf now than kind of the men so it seems to be kind of the number one sport at the moment and it became popular during COVID. You know, the, the golf courses for, for by and large remained open in the US and it was largely a, you know, just open space where um, people, um, you know, felt more comfortable. It was good, still very difficult to get a tee time anywhere uh, because so many people took up the sport um, at the time. And I would joke with people all the time that if you don't want to get COVID, the safest place in the whole world is the middle of the fairway and a yeah. public golf course, you know, exactly. so. Uh, <laughs> so but as a youngster you were more into i mean at the time uh, baseball i loved baseball when i was younger yeah and so which team do you follow because you've lived in several different places so, i mean oh no, it... no no well i grew up in boston i'm a red sox fan when you grow up a red sox fan there's no deviating oh. from that you know so that's and same thing with all boston sports bruins celtics you know patriots um yeah we're, as a, we're, as a kid, we're everywhere. As a kid, you wanted to be a baseball player when you grew up. I did. Right. So, yeah, well, you know, so there, there's these things about being good enough to make Major League Baseball is, is what you were in the college a, team and everything. No, I played tennis in college, but um, I played baseball when I was younger oh. and loved it. And in fact, it's a, it's a pretty interesting experience with baseball that um, uh, I'll share with you because. I was probably 11 at the time. There was a guy in my neighborhood. I think he was probably 19. His name was Jerry. And Jerry was playing minor league baseball at the time. And somehow I saw him somewhere and we started playing catch. And he said to me, he said, so tell me, what position do you play? And I said, well, I'm a pitcher. And he said, are you good? And I'm kind of kicking the dirt, looking down, thinking, oh, I'm all right, you know, kind of thing as you do when, you know, and, and he, he caught the ball for me and he looked at me and he said, he said, if you're good, it's okay to say so. And I thought, wow. And, and, and actually, it was, so, it was such a profound moment. I felt like it was the first time someone had actually given me permission to say that if you're good at that, at something, you can own that. And I think when, when we imagine how we go about life, uh, whether it's as a family member, whether it's a team member in a sport or in our companies or whatever that happens to be, if we can own our place and, and our contribution and recognize our gifts and where and how we can make a difference, uh, I think that's a, it's a huge lesson. And I feel like that lesson for me began that day as a, as a kid, just throwing a baseball around with some, I don't think I ever played catch with them again. It was that one time and rather remarkable. And so I think, again, you kind of equate these experiences, whether it's looking up at the stars or uh, a little, you know, otherwise meaningless uh, little game of catch one day playing baseball. And you can think about taking these experiences and what they mean to us as entrepreneurs, what they mean to us as, uh, as people who are just trying to make a difference and live a purposeful life. And um, so, you know, th these things, which is why I appreciated in the, as your guests probably know, we, we get a questionnaire, you know, from you and you want to know about us, not just about our business. And I think, that kind of a questionnaire isn't just about giving you answers, but I think it's a real opportunity to reflect uh, on a lot of the things that kind of shape who we are. And um, so I appreciated that. And it's kind of fun to be able to uh, talk about some of these things where you don't typically uh, on a program like this. So uh, nicely done. Uh, thank you for that. And I, I love what you said, because uh, I, I love that kind of that emotional connection. And Sometimes when someone says something to you, um, I, I was at an event and just digressed a little bit and people were asking, it's an entrepreneurial one. People were asking, at what point do I call myself the expert? And the reply back was, when you feel that you're ready. There isn't a set time. If you feel that you're the expert and you have an, a, a good knowledge at something, 
then you and you know a lot more than kind of the average person. If you feel you're ready to call yourself the expert, then call yourself the expert. You don't have to wait for someone to be telling you, oh, you're the expert in your field. So it was kind of something like that. So we've always thought- Yeah, I, I, can, I can appreciate that. I think it aligns a bit with what I'm saying. What, what, what's funny though, is when it comes to the expert conversation, mm-hmm. um, I, I will shy away from that. Not because I'm afraid of it, uh, but because um, I think there are things, you know, when we think about communication, it isn't just what we say, it's what we show. Um, I like to think from my perspective that I'm not the expert in what I do. I always remain a student of what I do. And that's what's going to keep me at the forefront of things. It's what's going to keep me constantly discovering, exploring and new and getting new things and keeping me at the top of my game. I think the moment I start thinking of myself as an expert is the day that, you know, you, you just don't approach it with that same level of, um, uh, of attention. And, but however, if someone wants to refer to me as the expert, um, not because I'm waiting for them to tell me, but because I have demonstrated that to them, right? We think about our personal brands. We think about who we are. It isn't who we say we are or what we say we can do. It's what people conclude about us after they spend time with us. And so um, I'm happy to communicate being the expert, but I will never say it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I like that philosophy because you're right. We never stop learning. Mm-hmm. And there's always going to be people that will say that they know more than you. And maybe. Yeah, what are they, know, more of an expert? I mean, yeah. Really, <laughs> yeah <exactly>. so. <laughs> <laughs> so. But is it. Is yeah, it how debate? are you? We're getting people joining. Very nice. Yeah. So, so yeah, Hello, just, just quickly. I mean, we've got <clears throat> Inma. I mean, maybe you can just say quickly. Who you are, where you're from, or where, where are you? Uh, hello, hello everyone. Sorry for being late. Um, so I am from Moscow, Russia, and um, I'm a writer and content strategist. Uh, so it's uh, been, uh, I think, the fifth uh, session uh, I've joined. Uh, and it's always good to see uh, amazing people as featured guests. Uh, so. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. And Inma will be a guest at some point as well. And, <laughs> yes. and we also, see, we, we have a variety of people from all over the world. So it's great. So, and Paul? What was the question, huh? Uh, the, other, the other Paul, not you, Paul. Uh, we, we always get these two Pauls mixed up, you see. Yeah, we've got uh, Paul John. <laughs> Yeah. I, actually, both Pauls, I mean, you didn't, because you joined late, you didn't introduce yourself. So maybe Paul Bishop, since you started talking first, if you could just say, where, where are you and, and what you do? Okay, uh, I'm Paul. I'm Paul Bennett Bishop. I didn't say this last week, but Paul means small and Bennett means blessed. You know what a bishop is, so I'm a small blessed bishop. And I'm based in South Africa. I have a global interest in business. Yeah, actually, if you want to catch up and, and listen, Paul uh, Paul's recording was last week, so he was the guest. Mm. So I have the recording if, if you want to to hear more about what Paul does. And Paul Johnny. Yeah, hi, I'm Paul Johnny. I'm from uh, Bombay, India, and uh, I make software for uh, magazine companies, and uh, that's my specialization. I've been late today. Sorry for that. Thank you. Yeah, we've got a nice global audience here this today. Yeah. Right. yeah, so we have a mixture. And, and just coming back, you mentioned about Brandon earlier. So we have our Brandon expert here as well. Don't we, Pete? <laughs> I hesitate. Or, or, to or can't I call you an expert? You maybe ah, you're not an see? expert. Yeah, yeah exactly. you're still learning. <laughs> um, I love brands. Uh, I love the way that people interact with brands. And I think of brands like uh, relationships that we have with individuals. So to me, it's a, it's a really special place. And as a result of that, um, it's fun to explore the possibilities with brands. You know, uh, Pete, you'd love this guy that I used to work with at Mullen Lowe. 
And when he was talking about brand and he would, he used the word work, but he said, you know, good work uh, tells you what a product does and why you should buy it. He said, great work tells you what a, um, uh, conveys what a brand stands for and invites you to share in its belief. Uh, and a, it's such a, you know, uh, elevated, you know, where to your point, it's not about transactions. It's about really building relationships. And, um, and, and I think that, you know, not to put it in, in kind of product terms, but for, for people, I mean, hopefully that's what we're about. We're not about trying to be transactional with one another. We're trying to build connections, build relationships to, you know, like kind of what Entnest is all about. So, um, as Victoria is here. So, uh, yeah. So anyway, we, yeah, we encourage people to um, obviously network afterwards. Uh, I just want to kind of catch up now to where you are now in your business. So where, what are you doing now? Kind of what led you to what you're doing now? And was there kind of a pivot point in your career that <clears throat> made you kind of decide that you wanted to do your own thing? Yeah. Um, so I spent about 25 plus years in corporate communications and brand. And there was a, um, the, a job that I had um, with a company called Vistage Worldwide. Now, Vistage assembles and facilitates peer advisory groups for CEOs and business leaders now in 22 countries around the world. And um, I was there doing, basically, I was the corporate communication brand head. Um, and I led a brand refresh of the company back in 2012. And one of the reasons I went to Vistage was I was extremely intrigued with what they do because of my experience in graduate school, having been part of um, a cohort, right? It was kind of the first learning experience where the students really learned from one another. You know, I, I joked about the fact when I was in high school or in uh, undergraduate, you know, this whole idea of collaborative learning would have been called cheating. You know, <laughs> I mean, it was not exactly... Um, you know, so to be in a place where you had this collaborative learning environment and then to come and be with a company where CEOs and key executives actually did that for one another through these peer advisory groups, I thought how fun it would be to kind of maybe get out of the agency business for a while and see if I could move the brand down the field uh, for about, and I was there for about six and a half years. And just to tell you quickly that in leading the brand refresh and I would ask a lot of CEOs and business leaders, I would say, how do you learn? How do you grow? How do you bring new thinking into your companies? And they would say things to me like, well, I read books. I have a coach. I hire consultants. I go to events and conferences. Some may tell me they attended um, uh, executive development programs at places like Harvard and Stanford. But as, as Pete is probably picking up on here, in an unassisted way, nobody's mentioned in peer groups as even part of their consideration set. So after... Uh, the brand refresh was completed and I was uh, meeting with the board of directors to update them on the rollout and where everything was. I basically said, look, Vistage has been doing this since 1957 and there's been a lot of other players that have been doing this for quite some time. So every one of you is trying to sell a BMW to someone who doesn't even know what a car is. I said, so maybe, and this was kind of where the work led there, we step back and not to write some kind of hardcover Vistage brochure about how great we are and what our business is all about, but to look at the entire category. Maybe we could learn something, not only from what peer groups all over the world are doing, but we could really create a narrative for people so when um, so that we could basically make it part of their consideration set. We would add it to the list of things they would consider when it came to how they would learn and grow and what that looks like. So that led to uh, a book that uh, I co-authored with the CEO of Vistage at the time called The Power of Peers and how the company you keep drives leadership growth and success. And, um, and from there, once the book was completed and I had a bunch of Vistage chairs who were the people who lead these Vistage groups, um, I was in an event. They're all really good at asking questions. I'm surrounded by like nine of them. So it was a completely unfair uh, exchange. And, uh, but they were really just saying, hey, this book is done. You've got a lot of great models and frames and everything here. W w where do you want to take this? And it really got me thinking about how we could take the content from this book that has since been advanced quite a bit um, to help CEO peer groups um, basically maximize the experience that they were having with one another. Then I started working with new groups to basically use it as an aspirational exercise for, hey, we're forming this group. 
Who do we want to be when we grow up? What does that look like? How are we going to serve and help one another? Um, and then again, now I've done over, I've done over 250 programs. I've done 220 of those workshops for CEO groups. And it was during obviously that time, it became plainly evident that everything that these peer groups do so brilliantly in terms of how they interact with one another uh, can be applied to teams in organizations to make them higher performing. So I wrote a second book in 2018 that basically followed a podcast that I had done where I interviewed 50 of these incredible guests, really successful in a, in a range of fields. And to every person I asked them, so did you get to where you are today all by yourself? And they would look at me and they would laugh, right? They're like, no, of course not. There's like countless people that helped me get, you know, I could never pay them all back. The only thing I try to do maybe is pay it forward to other people who I know, you know, uh, you know, who, you know, just in exchange for those, to those who helped me uh, when they were growing up. And that's when the second book, What Anyone Can Do, um, which was basically, uh, and th this actually comes from a quote, um, in a book that I read, it was written by uh, Joe Henderson, former Runner's World editor back in 1976, who basically said, look, when you look at really successful runners or people that are successful at anything, he said, um, they're not capable of like superhuman feats. They can't leap tall buildings in a single bound. They do the things that anyone can do, but most of us never will. So my contention is surround yourself with the right people and they will help you do those things that anyone can do far more often. So this is where, you know, again, then you do the workshops and all that. I start making much more, uh, uh, you know, specific connections from what groups do really well to what teams can adopt. And so the work I do today is not only with CEO and key executive peer groups, helping them maximize the experience, but I'm also doing more and more work with companies, showing them how, and especially I think, considering the challenges that we've all had over the last 18 plus months, right? And the, and the challenges we're gonna to continue to have with people when it comes to whether we're going back to the office, whether we're gonna be hybrid, whether teams will remain remote, whatever that's gonna look like. And to really have intentional conversations about how they can work together, all aligned by purpose, right? All aligned by why we're there. Um, and, um, you know, so that's what gets me excited every day. That's where I get up. And I, I don't think there was some big conscious decision to say, oh, I want to do my own thing now. I just followed the work and I followed where it led me. And I just know that I enjoy it um, like I've never enjoyed anything else. Actually, it's fantastic. I mean, you say so many kind of inspiring things that I, I could just sit back and just listen. And, and sometimes I'm so busy listening, engaged, and forgetting that I'm actually kind of hosting this and and asking you questions. So, I mean, it's quite relaxing in the way that I'm comfortable and just hearing what you're saying because that that kind of resonates with me. And there's lots of things that we are still learning and and the different way of working. And I know, I mean, from the questionnaire that you've also got a question that you like to propose to or post to the audience. But just going back on the books. I, the, the reason why I particularly wanted Pete to be on this call is because having known Pete, and not just because you're both from the US, but I, I see a lot of similarities in, in, the, in the mindset and the way that you work, and that Pete has written books as well. So actually, when I speak with you, I think I'm speaking to Pete in a way. So I mean, mm. in a positive way. So I mean, although, uh, yeah, so that, that's why I kind of wanted to also help network and bring people together because I thought that it's, it's better that if I can introduce people, then if they want to engage and talk later, then that's entirely up to them, but mm -hmm. at least have, sure. the, have the opportunity. So, but I mean, with everybody, because everybody <clears throat> has a story to tell. So yeah, you had a, a question about, I mean, you, you, I asked you and you said about kind of the future of work. So maybe you can ask the question. I think since you have it in front of you and that I filled out that questionnaire about a week and a half ago, <laughs> I'm happy to have you read it. <laughs> okay. So I mean, the, the, the questionnaire. Five, uh, 6 a.m. for him. You know, so he's still. I didn't used to do the up. questionnaire. It was just that I used to have a call with the person before, but I, I'd have so many notes and have to spend so much time writing it down. 
Uh, I thought it was easier just to create the questionnaire <clears throat> and, and and then I can just give them the link and it's easy, easier for me. So I tried to simplify it. So it doesn't mean I have to ask all the questions or we have to do it all. It's just a kind of to help steer a conversation. But since since you asked, then I will ask the question. So, so this is not from me, this is from Leo, but it's a, a question to the audience. So, right, let's just find it. So you'd like to know, the, the question is from the, to the audience, I'd like to know how you see the future of work. So anyone can kind of raise their hand and, and let us know what you see. I think the future of work is something that's going to be developing. And also if everything that's happening right now, we see that, hey, it is the future now, you know, everything's changing to hybrid remote, everyone's deciding, but it's not the first point and it's not the last one. So I think the future of work is always going to be developing and maybe in a few years, we're going to see a whole different setup. Uh, but at the moment, I think it's very important that values are coming in also in like a work setting. So uh, people start to realize like, hey, I need to also spend time with my family and also spend time learning and developing myself and all that stuff. So future of work is something I believe it's going to be um, a very holistic approach and combining also life and development and all that stuff together. Right. Uh, also, yeah, thanks, Victoria. Is it Leo? Um, yeah, I like what she said, because I do think we're going to, and there's two things. One, um, I, I, I've never really felt comfortable with this construct of kind of work-life balance. I think that's a kind of a false narrative. Uh, um, mm -hmm. I, I think it is, it is one. I think it's really about being committed to excellence in our lives, um, period, whether it's personally, professionally, or, or in everything we do. Um, but I think the other when I think about the future of work, part of it is yes, remote or hybrid and all of that. But part of it is going to be we are still, you know, at the dawn of of when, you know, imagine today uh, versus 10 years from now and the presence of AI in the workplace, not as our competitor, but as our partner. And what that will, for me at least, will involve tapping into even more what makes us human. Um, not trying to, you're never going to do as many calculations as fast you know, as, as, as the machine, but you can tap into, I think, what makes us so powerful and extraordinary as human beings and our ability to, um, and, and not to mention our ability to collaborate and what that's going to look like. And so that's why, Victoria, in particular, I you know, take an interest in EntNest with this notion of a trusted human connection and collaboration, because we we really have to look within ourselves um, and and trust um, to try to I think unlock what and bring that human being to the workplace. You know, in many respects, think about the fact that during COVID, I think for a lot of workplaces, I thought one of the great ironies was that the employees tended to become closer together once we pulled them out of a central workplace. Right, because we go to a central workplace, we all have our work hats on, we have our title, we have our jobs, and all this other stuff. Now, all of a sudden, you've got everyone on a screen, and you've got people's kids in the background. You've got dogs, you've got cats running across keyboards. You've got you know artifacts behind people that you get a sense of who they are and what they care about and what their interests are. And and I think with that, when we started tapping into our you know, shared humanity a little bit and, and start recognizing that as we are all trying to do our jobs, we're all have our own challenges, you know, to deal with. And I think there was a level of understanding and cooperation and collaboration that happened for many teams, not everybody, uh, but for many teams that actually did drive productivity. And I think also brought um, a little bit of a, I, I hope that as people return to the workplace, that we tend to keep that human connection, not just that colleague, fellow employee connection with one another. Um, and I think that's where a lot of, uh, where we're gonna need to draw our strength from um, going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, we that's could talk about this subject all day. So I just wanted to, since Inma, you raised your hand, uh, uh, yeah. did you have a question? Uh, no, I just wanted to, to 
comment uh, on, on the same uh, topic, the future of work. Just a few words. Well, I agree with what uh, Leo and Victoria just said, and I just wanted to add that um, uh, given the uh, advances of technology and its um, uh, de uh, very fast development, we'll all have to uh, learn new things uh, all throughout our lives and uh, if before it could be uh, getting new skills and knowledge uh, every 10 years now it's uh, every month because uh, it's accelerating yeah <laughs> thank you all right hence hence being the student right we're always learning exactly. we're always trying to get better absolutely <laughs> so we I don't want to run out of time before we get to a bit more about kind of your business, the name of your business, why it's called that, and also <laughs> some of some of the things that you do, because you actually do podcasts as well. So you do your own podcasts and I you do. do a number of other things. So maybe you can just touch on kind of your business. Where are you in your business and what it is that you do now and a bit more yep. about some of the, the up and coming events and things that you do. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm founder and managing partner of a company that's now just over two years old called Peer Innovation LLC. Uh, Peer Innovation is, uh, comes from a word, actually it was a, a headline in a blog post I wrote in like 2012 and then decided to use it as the name of the company, which essentially takes the word peer, people like me, and innovation, which I see as creativity realized. And and it, it's this idea now, again, of me working with peer groups to help them maximize their potential, right? This is about when we get people who are committed to a uh, common set of values, uh, who when come together with diverse perspectives, are able to create something larger than themselves. They can do it in a group, right? And groups, basically, let's face it, are really about... Um, outcomes for the individual members of the group or a team, it's much more about a shared work product or something only a team can do together. Uh, but in either way, when people are just trying to help one another be better, whether it's for, you know, to help someone realize something that they've expressed they want for themselves, and we want to be a partner in that, uh, or we want to work together as a team, whether it, we're trying to win a championship or we're trying to, you know, create a product. Uh, one of the things that I've certainly found, whether it's in business or in sports, is that if you take, and I'll use sports as an example, if you take any team in any sport that you regard as the team that is often winning the championship or always part of the conversation. For those teams, winning the championship is not the goal every year. For those teams, getting better every day is the goal. That's what they do. That's what they're committed to. They're committed to learning and growing and getting better. And they realize that if they do that, if they make that daily effort and try to be just a little better tomorrow than they were the day before, then they'll always be in a position where the reward is, is the championship. It isn't really the goal. And I think it's a perspective that um, the more businesses that take that, the more that we, um, you know, uh, James and I were talking just before the start of the show about the idea of, you know, if we're always focused on the money part of it, if we're always focused on the end, I think of it like someone who's playing poker. The person who's counting their poker chips, and not paying attention to the cards, they will lose. <laughs> you have to pay attention to what you're doing and you have to try to get better at it and be, be there all the time. And so I think a lot of what uh, peer advisory groups do really well and what peer innovation is all about is making sure that they have, you've got the right people in the room, that they enjoy psychological safety. Um, not only that they have an environment of psychological safety, but they understand how to leverage it and have the courage and the generosity to truly be open and vulnerable and take advantage of that space. Um, with that, it drives productivity. And there's no question it unlocks everyone's potential when you um, have the right people together who enjoy that psychological safety. And, and then what does that do? It creates a healthy culture of accountability where people are comfortable challenging one another because they are all about the common purpose of the organization. The gentleman who I quoted, Pete, uh, earlier, Edward Bochus, is when I worked at a place called Mullen. Uh, Mullen, by the way, Mullen Low today, they're... Um, uh, logo is an octopus with boxing gloves. And it's kind of just what it's like to work there. However, 
you would mistake a lot of conflict in that company with like, wow, that's rough, you know, and it's, it's um, these people are always fighting against one another. They're actually not fighting against one another at all. They're fighting for the best idea. They recognize that the more they challenge one another, they realize that there's a lot of smart people here, but they're not as smart as all of us together. And when we challenge each other, this is where we are here to do what? Create the best advertising in the world. So no one takes things personally. No, you just have a culture that's truly committed to producing great work. And then finally, you've got leadership that isn't about, they're not there for their own self-aggrandizement. They don't look at their teams as there to make them look good. They recognize that their job as a leader is to serve that team and help them be as successful as they possibly can be. Um, this is what groups do brilliantly. Again, I think it's what um, uh, uh, great teams do really well. When you look at really great teams, they have what we call a, a robust learning achieving cycle, right? That daily commitment to getting better. And at the same time, they have the ingredients around right people, psychological safety, productivity, accountability, and leadership. You know, tighter on time here. So I wanted to do that fast, but that's the work I'm doing right now with, with groups and teams. And like I said, to watch it work and to watch how effective uh, it can be is really exciting. All right, you, you're muted, James. There we go. Kind of flip back on you. There yeah, we go. My <clears throat> laptop's going a bit crazy at the moment. So I, I was trying to drag something and drop it in there as a link to your website and yeah i froze myself but but anyway <laughs> yeah I, I i love what you do i'm just trying to share some of the links as well in the chat so people can connect to you as well so on linkedin twitter and all, all the other ones that you shared i was just trying to put your website in there but it just seemed to hang at the moment so there's tons and tons of stuff that uh really fascinate and interest me as well i you're in kind of the right place with the right mindset of people in the way that particularly people on this call that I think would share kind of the, the same opinion and philosophies that that you're talking about and you do have yeah I just wanted to touch on also I mean if people want to know about your business and what you do then they can look at the links it's just in the essence of time and but you have some up and coming events coming up so maybe you can share about those as well yeah um yeah interesting enough yeah i'm doing um a uh a vistage group meeting where i'll be working with a group in uh, huntsville alabama um uh, on tuesday um and um there's a couple of other things in addition to some other uh commitments for vistage and a lot of the new groups that are opening i'm uh, keynoting at a um, what's called the nine nine share basically, which is involves a bunch of um, people from all different companies all over who happen to uh, be on the workday platform. And so this community basically is one where people help each other be better at using that platform and really leveraging, you know, all its tremendous advantages. And then I'm doing another event uh, in September uh, for Renaissance executive forums that I'm um, really excited about. Okay. And of course, last but not least, um, I, I do want to mention on August 26th, I am doing an event for Entnest um, and really excited about doing that as well. Right. So, so all kinds can... of fun stuff going on. So, and connect with me on LinkedIn, by the way, if um, I would really enjoy that for all of you. Okay. And the event in Entnest, we can, you've posted it already, so we can see that or you yet to post it? I think Victoria will be posting that event um, uh, at some point. Yeah, I know it's coming up on the 26th. Yeah, she had to drop off on the air. So right. She, okay. And yeah, I have someone knocking at the door now. <laughs> so yeah, I, in saying that, I, I would like to follow you as well. So look out for that. So if people want to know more about your events and how do we find out about them, your website or some other way? Yeah, no, I think uh, website, LinkedIn, I'm really active on LinkedIn. I post a lot of content all the time, but then of course you can go to the website and whether it's under the podcast link or under the media link. I, I'm also a board member and um, uh, opinion columnist for CEO World. And I write probably 30 to 40 articles a year for them wow. now. Um, so yeah, so I have a lot of fun with that. So, so a couple of things just before we, we kind of wrap up. So sure. in, in your business now, are, are there, 
anything that we could help you with or, or is kind of missing or or you need some support with i can tell you that um i am doing again a lot of work with groups i want to do a lot more work with companies who are really interested and um you know getting their teams aligned um, I think it's obviously really important that people that you've got teams aligned behind any strategic initiative or organizational change initiative. When you think about the underperformance or failure rate uh, in those areas, uh, it's not typically because the strategy was bad. It's because you need everybody all in lined behind it and understanding, um, you know, its purpose and connecting to it in a way uh, that is really powerful. Also, I think. Um, there's incredible opportunities for groups and teams to work side by side in companies when you consider the hundreds of billion dollars spent in learning and development uh, every year and the fact that everyone is so busy with their jobs having to do more with less and, and more quickly and, and from home, you know, in many respects. And then trying to get people to actually not only learn, but apply new concepts in the workplace. And I think without a mechanism to do that, you're going to take a lot of great content that comes in front of people each and every year and have it just kind of go by the wayside in a way that's, I think, unnecessary. So I want to do more work with companies who are really interested in getting their teams aligned and, and, um, and just working together more effectively. And again, the, the great part and what I love about the work I do is I don't tell anybody what's best for them or what they get to determine that for themselves. I basically use my framework to facilitate a conversation where they get to figure out what it is they want for themselves and how to make that possible. Okay, so, so I like coaching what you do for the groups. Excuse me? Uh, it's more like coaching these groups uh, while working with them. Not yeah, you fun. know, um, I, I certainly can provide some, um, you know, adds to because I've seen so many different groups and teams, of course, and the, I'll, I'll get questions about, well, we want to do this. How, how have other teams accomplished that? You know, but then again, I think they will figure out what resonates for them, what's right for them, what will they do, what will they commit to and call their own. Uh, and I think when you get people to do that and own their own solutions, uh, that's when you really have some um, chance that they will be, um, you know, executed over time excellent so i i know we could talk on a lot and i still have a, a dozen questions that i'd like to ask as well so but in in the essence of time and, and kind of wrapping up now then i would uh encourage people to connect with you and um, both in ns but also linkedin because i mean uh if you're not always on ns then then linkedin is a is a good alternative. yeah i'm always on linkedin yeah yeah likewise so, and then also to find out more about, I mean, I, you know, some of the podcasts that you've done and you've recorded, there, there's some- Yeah, the Pure Innovation podcast, right. Yeah, <laughs> as you mentioned, there's some great guests in there. Actually, I'd like to be a guest on-, on one Well, let's do it. All right, so, let's just make that happen right here. Let's yeah, do it. And I'm sure maybe people here would also welcome sure. that as well. So let's I mean, definitely look at that. I think anything like this that we can help one another, then you just bring additional value. So, I mean, it's just you help me, I help you, kind of thing. So, uh, so as I said, I've, I shared some links. I will post them into also the the, the comments on Entness so people can see if they haven't already captured them here. If you want to capture the the chat, then go yourself and you can save it. Or that. you'd like to leave us with as just as a final word. Or... Leo, thank you very much for. Oh. we lost it james uh, yeah we had we lost, lost you for a little bit oh, okay. you know. yeah i was just i was just going to say we're just kind of wrapping up is there a final thought that you want to leave us with just before we go well you know one of the themes uh, in my latest book peer innovation what peer advisory groups can teach us about building high performing teams is that the power of we begins with you. It begins with each of us. And I think uh, kind of goes back to something we talked about earlier was when we start really recognizing uh, and owning the gifts that we have and the difference we can make. Um, you know, I, I think that's a, that's a great start. So uh, I'd like to think, of course, everyone on this call uh, is all about that. And to the extent we can inspire that in others, um, I think that would be um, 
uh, a nice way to start our week next week. Excellent. So on that note, I'd like to thank Leo for being our 58th guest. Uh, absolute pleasure to have you. And I definitely want to connect with you and learn more about what you do. I'd like to be a guest on your podcast and yeah, see how we can kind of collaborate more and, and, and maybe bring other people into kind of a, a bigger picture of what we all are trying to achieve anyway. So on that note, I, I wish everyone a fantastic weekend. Thank and you. Yeah. Please feel free to join any week. I mean, it's the same time every Friday. I know it's an early start for you, for you, Leo, but I mean, the recordings are available if you want. You just have to reach out and just let me know and I'll, I'll post you the recording. And oh, it was a pleasure meeting everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Now there's some great people here. I'm, I'm sure they're going to reach out or, or vice versa. And yeah, we start some additional conversations going. And I, I think that there's some, I mean, everyone great here. So everybody gets the value from, from being on these events. So thank you once again, the audience for participating and the regular ones that come on every week. And Leo for being a fantastic guest. Thank you. So on that thank note. You, thank you. Thank you, Leo. Bye-bye. Thank you, Leo. Bye -bye. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thanks, Paul. Bye. So thank you. That was fun, James. Enjoyed that. You're welcome. We, we, we went a long way. We, we were it's a quarter after the hour already. So hopefully that'll work out for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no problem. I've just got to shoot now, so. All right. Hey, See so long. Thanks, you everyone. Bet.